Thank you so much. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how we think about our platform at Metadata, not to talk about Metadata specifically, but to talk about how we think we can respond to that call to action, because there are amazing things happening around us. And we think that one of the key things that we need to do as an industry is to look at data in new ways, is to think about how we leverage that to generate information to deliver things to patients. If you go into any Medidata office in the world, and we are ostensibly a software company, right? we're a platform that people log into and they interact with data, but we have a mission statement around powering smarter treatments and healthier people. That drives everything we do. It is a life sciences mission. What do we mean by that? We mean that, and we've heard different definitions of precision medicine. I actually really like the one where you think about the human body. Um, that's new to me. But in our case, we talk about giving the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. That means that the best available therapies on market are given to patients when they walk in the door of a clinic or a, a hospital anywhere in the world. And in some cases, a patient will be well-suited for or better suited by an experimental therapy. They will be a volunteer in a clinical trial. And how do we make sure that those patients are served as well as we possibly can? And this is an amazing time for experimental therapies. There are quantitative ways to support that. There are qualitative ways to support that. If you look at the kinds of therapies coming to market, we are taking diseases that used to be chronic conditions and we are curing them, and we are taking things that were life-threatening and we are turning them into maintainable chronic conditions. We're targeting molecules that 10 years ago would have sounded like science fiction, and what better exclamation point around the science fiction that we are all now turning into science than the first presentation this afternoon. So there's amazing things that we're bringing to patients, but at what cost? Well, one cost is time. And I think we just heard that very compellingly put. Patients are waiting. So when we have these new experimental therapies, it's essential that we amass the data that produces evidence that proves to regulators, proves to physicians, to prescribers, proves to payers that these new therapies are worthy to be in the market so they can fulfill their ultimate mission of addressing as many patients in the world as possible. And where time is usually a factor, so is usually money. And that is certainly the case. If you look at the cost of going through the process of getting something from a laboratory into the point where a patient can benefit from it, it takes not just too much time, but an extraordinary amount of money. So what can we do with technology to make this new world of medicine that we're coming into a reality in less time and with less money? If you accept my premise, that we are at the, the dawn of precision medicine. We just heard about manipulating people's genomes and turning certain genes on or off inside people's nervous systems. Right? We are at a time where we're being incredibly specific in how we can treat disease from a molecular perspective. But if you accept this premise, then you also have to accept some mathematical certainties that come along with it. Precision medicine means that every time I create one of these great new therapies, the number of patients who benefits from it, mathematical certainty, is smaller and smaller. The ultimate precision medicine is for one person, a personalized medicine. Therefore, there are eight billion people in the world who won't benefit from that thing that was made for me. It means that these therapies are complicated. Define a group of people who will benefit from a therapy. Right, this used to be easy. The, the last 70 years of the life sciences industry were built around ideas like, let's figure out has, who has high blood pressure and give all of them something. By the way, that's half the planet. Right, let's figure out who has high cholesterol. Let's give them all something. That's the other half of the planet. Well, probably the same half of the planet. It, when we think about defining groups of patients more specifically, it always comes with additional measurements that we need to make about those people. The criterion the criteria get longer and longer by which we define them. It also means that every time we decide we're going to measure something else about a particular patient, 
we have more data that we have to collect. We have more data that we have to manage. Um, it was not long ago, uh, in the grand scheme of things, it was about 20-something years that at Columbia University, I had to move from the laboratory that I worked in to another building to get pieces of data around patients that were part of my research project. That, unfortunately, is still close enough to either the literal or the metaphorical standard of care in terms of how a lot of data comes together in medicine. So with all this great precision, we have all these problems around measurement and managing all that data. And that is exactly where we think that technology comes into play. So what we do at Medidata is we connect everybody who is working in clinical research together. We connect the life sciences professionals, like some of the people who have been on stage today. We connect the patients, as you've heard already today from other presenters, as all of us in the room at some point in our lives, um, almost statistically are guaranteed to be at some point. We connect all of the research projects, not all of them, um, but about half of the research projects going on around the world right now, sponsored by industry, are happening in Medidata's platform. Um, you may look at those five million patients and say, oh, well, I know health systems that have hundreds of millions of patients, or this data set that you can find somewhere is you know, all the patients in certain countries. Yeah, these are really interesting patients. These are patients that we should care about a lot because this is a data set that is enriched. It's biased. You know, as scientists, we usually don't like bias. This is a good kind of bias. This data set is biased for patients who are clinically relevant to the most exciting therapies that are being made today. And what we try to do is leverage this ecosystem in new ways. We are helping people, yes, get their approvals in different therapeutic areas. We work in oncology, we work in Alzheimer's disease, we work in diabetes, pretty much any therapeutic area that people do research in, we have represented on the Medidata platform. But we think about our platform in a fundamentally different way. Yes, it is a tool for conducting clinical trials, but what I want to hopefully get you excited about and think about collaborating with people on, and again, it's not about Medidata, it's about the idea, is creating this environment where all of this data comes together and can be accessed in new ways. So regardless of what the kind of information we need about a particular patient is going to be to figure out if they're the right candidate for a therapy, to figure out if that therapy was safe, if that therapy was effective, if that therapy is valuable. Maybe they're wearing an EEG helmet. Maybe I'm just taking their blood. Maybe they're going to a clinic. Whatever those forms of data are, we assemble them on our platform. And as I said before, we're a software as a service company. Maybe because of what I've just already told you, you think, oh, well, Medidata is awesome. Well, they're really kind of thinking about data. They're a data company. Actually, I think the ultimate thing that we need to think about in life sciences, when, when I say life sciences, I'm talking about science where the subjects, the people in our, the, the subjects in our experiments are people. Right? So the thing that we have to think about is evidence generation and being as efficient with evidence generation as possible. And that's why you want to assemble all this data. So if you think about that challenge, where we have fewer and fewer patients who fit into any definition of who is going to benefit from a particular therapy, yet we have all these complicated questions we have to answer, and we have the appropriately very high bar of regulators who are out to protect us, payers who we can have other conversations about motivations around the world, but largely are there to benefit from your increased health, from a GDP and productivity perspective at the very least, and evidence to all of us as people that we want these therapies. That's what we're trying to drive, this generation of evidence. And we think that by bringing data together, we can start to be in a new era of how we think about the science of life sciences, how we think about evidence generation and getting more turns from every piece of data that is gathered. That is the fundamental premise of what we're trying to, to bring to the market. We really think that actually this is a, a change, not just in terms of what one company might do, but really a fundamental change in the way kind of we think about the world of life sciences that will define the next 
50 years, 100 years. Like I said, I think you can pretty much look back at, at 70 years of life sciences, almost 80 years now, and it's really been designed with a particular purpose of finding good therapies that work for lots and lots of people. But as we go into this world with smaller and smaller groups of people who benefit, and we want to bring benefits to so many people, it's not just about the beginning of this slide, which is really kind of the arc of integrating data and getting everybody to connect to one another. Now it's about what do we do with those connections? How do those connections generate real value for every single stakeholder in life sciences, which is every single one of us? So let me give you some examples. I think the first talk around scale was a great introduction for these two examples I'm going to give you. Because this isn't a big data example I'm going to tell you about. This is a small data example. There's a rare disease called Castleman disease. It's an autoimmune disease. Um, imagine your immune system just absolutely getting fully activated and constantly doing what it's normally supposed to do in a good way when you have some kind of foreign invader. But it just starts to become overactive and starts to ultimately attack your own body and you go into organ failure and it is definitely a life-threatening disease. So if, um, hopefully most people don't know about Castleman disease, but if you are unfortunate enough to be somebody who knows somebody with it or, or are somebody with it, um, there is some good news. Um, there was a drug on the market, still on the market, um, called, it's called siltuximab and it can actually stop Castleman disease from progressing and it works in about one out of every five patients. Now, I told you this is a small data example. There are about 4,000 people who get diagnosed with Castleman a year. This is a very small group. So imagine the patient scarcity in terms of finding these, these 4,000 needles in the haystack of earth. And imagine beyond that, trying to figure out how to find out of those 4,000, the ones who want to volunteer or could volunteer to be in an experiment to test a new drug or why a particular drug works and doesn't work. So, like many rare diseases, there's a very rich patient advocacy organization that connects to people with Castleman disease. We were fortunate enough to get connected to them. And remember you saw that data coming into the MediData platform? What we did is we took data, not from one Castleman study, but from multiple Castleman studies some done by different companies, some done by different hospitals, and put that all into one data set. And then we supplemented that data with proteomics data about those patients. Literally, let's look at what genes are on or off in those different patients. And by profiling those patients in that way, we were able to go from a 19% efficacy rate for siltuximab to identifying a patient population that had almost 70% efficacy. This is literally precision medicine being delivered, taking a compound and helping define what patients should benefit from it. Now, if you're sitting there doing the math, um, I hope you're worried about those four patients out of the five who right, aren't the ones who are gonna be helped by cetuximab. Um, actually, there's a lot of hope for them too, and a lot of that comes from some of this same kind of work. And so another thing about this evidence generation era is that we're going from a world where doing research has traditionally been something around hypothesis confirmation. Almost everybody who's worked in life sciences, myself certainly included, understands that. You're handed a hypothesis and your job is to hopefully prove it, or at least figure out that it's incorrect so somebody can decide what the next experiment is. But there's not usually a virtuous cycle of generating new ideas out of that research that results in more breakthroughs. And when you think about data the right way and connect it, like we did with these Castleman patients and what genes were on and off, you start to be able to create new hypotheses about other drugs, other things that could help these patients, other diseases that Castleman looks like, or at least the subtypes of Castleman that we've identified looks like. So with small data, but connectivity and new thinking and the determination to get more turns of evidence, we can create real hope for patients that can be delivered in a short amount of time. Let me give you a big example. So I uh, told you that we do about half of the clinical trials that are around the world. And 
if you, it's not a medi idea, metadata idea. If you go back and look in literature, um, the earliest one we found was from the, the early 1970s. There's been an idea in life sciences um, around taking data that was from previous research. So patients have gone into some research study, they volunteered, their data was collected. And then at some point later, taking that data that was in research project one and trying to bring that data into research project two. Why did it take so long for people to do that? Well, it's because that actually is a very difficult thing to do. A lot of the time, the, the discrete data that was in research project one was actually sitting in the bottom of a file somewhere in the basement of that other building that I went to in the hospital or in the, the digital file cabinet in the, in the metaphorical basement of the pharmaceutical company only used in that particular context. Well, by creating this network effect, by bringing all of the data from multiple trials onto one platform, for the last few years, we have gone through a progression of being able to show at scientific conferences um, like ASCO, where you can take data from multiple studies, now that it's accessible, you can use semantics and modern data mapping techniques to actually get it out of the single files for single studies and create large data sets and use those not just as an interesting piece of data in an experiment, but remember, Remember the, the subjects or people? We actually now have clients who are looking at using, reusing this previously collected data so that you don't have to have a patient walk in the door for a new therapy and flip a coin and say, well, Glenn, you got lucky. You're gonna get this new experimental therapy and we're sorry, Glenn, you're the one who's getting standard of care because we're a good scientist and we have to have a control population. We're actually getting to the point that we're gonna be able to reuse this data from a control perspective. And not only can we use data like this, but actually just this last year at ASCO, we showed how you can take data, not just from clinical trials, but from the real world, it's a phrase I'm not crazy about, P patients in clinical trials are real too. Um, but when people walk into a physician's office and they are treated outside the context of an experiment, why can we not take that data and bring that into our same environment for evidence generation? We are in the early days of doing this, but as we look at things like multiple myeloma and non-small cell lung cancer and AML, we are seeing that this is mathematically possible. It is ethically a great idea for patients and it is something that can propel our industry forward and fix those problems around time and around money. If you look at the traditional view of clinical trials, this is the coin flip I was just telling you about. To generate a unit of evidence, we needed two patients. And two patients is probably not a good statistical sample. But every time we had somebody who was getting the new therapy, we would take somebody and we would give them a standard of care or a sugar pill or control. Technology is what is gonna change this to something where there's a much broader set of controls. When we're doing statistics, we, we like big denominators, right? I, mean, I hope you like big denominators if you're doing statistics. But if we don't reuse data in new ways, if we don't bring in new sources of data, we're limited by that two patients per one unit of evidence. And what we are now doing is taking patients who are getting these new exciting therapies and supplementing the denominators, not just with a smaller number of control patients, but with the reused patients from previous studies as, con as controls, with experimental comparators, with simulation, with predictive models. This is the new generation of evidence that we are going to be presenting to all the stakeholders that I mentioned before. And Yes, spoiler, you heard it from Patrick. Um, I think uh, now you probably can see why Tarek and myself and the, the rest of the Medidata team are so excited about um, uh, hopefully soon being part of Deso System because this is not something that, that a particular company or a single collaboration is going to solve. This requires a high scale platform where the entire world of life sciences can connect to make these ideas, the new normal reality and evidence generation. So with that, thank you very much.